Hello again, it's Anne with Broadband Illinois. We have a somewhat late arriving crowd for this first webinar, and we do have people that are dialing in, so I'm just going to ask for everyone's patience for another two to three minutes, and then we will get started. Thank you. Hi everyone and welcome to the first of the Broadband Innovation Fund Awardees webinar. I'm going to turn this over to Erin Facemeyer who's going to just give a few housekeeping ideas and how this is, is going to work. So here's Erin. Hello everyone. Um, so if uh, right now if you could just raise your hands um, in the program, in the webinar program so I know that everyone can hear me. Um, and if I can get enough hands raised, we'll just continue. We, we got a couple of people, yeah. It's looking like you all can hear me, so that's great. All right, so what we're gonna be doing is um, we're gonna be having uh, each of these four awardees present today. Um, each awardee is gonna get 10 minutes. Um, at about eight minutes, we'll give you a little chat. 
um, letting you know that you have two minutes left. And then at the end of that 10 minute session, there will be a five minutes of Q&A. Um, when it's time for an awardee to present, what will happen is um, I will turn over the mic to that awardee and um, they can go ahead and just, um, I will be controlling the PowerPoint for everyone except for Dot .world group. And uh, I will just, uh, you just let me know when to go to the next slide and we'll, we'll work it that way. And I think it should go pretty smoothly. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. So he touched upon a little bit. We only had two of the introduction slides and Broadband Illinois, we are very excited to start this webinar series. It is something that we have been planning since the awards happened and Unfortunately, the calendar and the time got the best of us. So we will have the first series today. The second one will be next Monday, the 17th. And then we will take a break over the holidays and have the final one to two webinars in January of 2013. Today, the awardee presentations will be coming from the city of Monmouth, Eastern Illinois University Business Solutions, Family Christian Health Center, and the Dot World Group. And as Aaron said, we have approximately 10 minutes set aside for them to review their slides and talk about the program and all the great things that they are doing throughout all of Illinois. And then you have five minutes at the end of each individual presentation. And then of course we will open it up at the end to any larger questions. And we hope you guys get a lot out of this. We had met with each of the awardees at our staff retreat in October and we were all just blown away and floored and so impressed and in person and listening to them they are even more dynamic than what the review committee had on the application so again thank you and we will get started the first one up is Paul the ever entertaining with the city of Monmouth so welcome Paul and thank you so much for joining us today Paul can you let's see all uh, right can you guys hear me now excellent yeah. yes um, yeah we're um, we're the city of Monmouth a little bitty if you're not familiar with uh, with Monmouth it's a small little uh, town in the middle of the cornfields and soybeans of West Central Illinois, about 15 miles from the Mississippi. And uh, what we really were excited about is um, one of the things that we've noticed in our community is we have this, this movement towards a, um, a real embracing of uh, technology both on the private sector and the business sector and with the, the, the growth of Monmouth College, which is also in our community. Um, but we also noticed that um, our population is aging, and there are such great stories to tell about our community um, that we realize that the time is really ripe to start uh, figuring out how to tell these narratives in a way that can take advantage of this digital technology and the expanded use of broadband in our, in our community, in our region, uh, to make these available for everybody. So why don't we go to the next slide. Um, so what we're looking at, at doing is uh, creating the Warren County Virtual Museum. And as a small community, probably like a lot of other uh, communities, regions, and counties in the state, we've got a historical society, a very active genealogical society, and we have a really pretty neat Warren County History Museum. Uh, the problem is getting access to these great resources uh, is kind of challenging. Um, there's not a lot of money. The Warren County History Society is a purely volunteer organization. Uh, it's membership driven. It's got this great facility, uh, but it's really only open for about four hours every month. But they have these great items that really tell the story of who we were in Monmouth, in Roseville, in Kirkwood. Um, so that was kind of where the germ of this idea was, was as the, the museum's really getting active in trying to uh, catalog its, uh, its holdings. And a, a lot of those holdings um, are 
just it's old school. It was it was all in a dark room in Roseville, and then it got moved over to the new museum in Monmouth, and they've never been cataloged. And, and the the volunteer group is doing a Herculean job of trying to organize and digitize uh, their collection. Uh, they're doing it through some real old technology, and as as a tech person, my my uh, the hair on the back of my neck kind of shivered because they're using an old version of Access. It's not net connected. Uh, and seeing that was was sort of the germ of the idea of what became the, the concept of the Warren County History Museum. And as, as you see from this side, we call, we're calling it Partners in Progress. One of the neatest things about this entire project was how easily and quickly this coalition came together around trying to create a digital vehicle to tell our stories. Um, so it started with the History Museum and what they're trying to do. Uh, but Monmouth College has all these other um, really fascinating connections, uh, collections. Uh, the Shields Collection of Antiquities, uh, they've got a recently new collection of uh, 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 early, uh, early tribal and uh, Paleolithic artifacts from our area. Um, they also are one of the three places in the world that has a Canopus stone, uh, which is basically like the Rosetta Stone, but actually predates the Rosetta Stone. It has Greek cuneiform and Egyptian hieroglyphics on there. Um, they also have this really interesting uh, curriculum that, that really kind of clicked into this, uh, which is all the seniors at Monmouth College are required to take one or more classes in civic and community literacy, where they're going out into our community and learning those stories. And one of the faculty members, Bridget Draxler, who is, uh, is working with, our, uh, with this uh, grant project, has a class called Local Heroes, and it's a, it's a class that gets the students out in the community uh, meeting, talking to, video interviewing uh, people who are the heroes of our community, whether they're in the Hispanic community, the business community, uh, the agricultural community, and this is part of that civic literacy uh, uh, requirement. And, and that was another kernel of this idea that we are trying to formulate. Wouldn't it be great if those stories, those local hero stories, could be put together in a way that could be shared for our entire region and community? And a couple other partners that are worth mentioning on the content side of the Warren County Public Library and the Buchanan Center for the Arts. And they worked together about a year and a half ago, putting together the local component of a Smithsonian Journey Stories exhibition that was held in our community and really did a Herculean job putting together these awesome resources, videos, audio interviews, images, uh, to tell the story of those people who traveled to Warren County and traveled to Monmouth. And that's another one of those things that was an absolutely great experience, but now it's just packed up in a room somewhere. There's no way to experience it. So if you think about all these things together, we've got this community that, that a lot of times, these small rural communities, and we're no different, are kind of struggling with a sense of identity. And we have all these resources that really inform who we are. Can we come up with some way to use broadband technology and the knowledge of some of the people in our community who are, are adept at software development to create a virtual museum? And um, you know, I, I'm applauding the fact that you know, not only were we fortunate enough to receive an innovation fund award, uh, but Midwest Bank of Western Illinois, um, the City of Monmouth, and uh, Frontier all stepped up with cash and in-kind contributions to help make this thing possible. Uh, next slide, please. And um, I, I, this is kind of an old school picture of uh, what the, the uh, uh, historical society is dealing with. And this only scratches the surface of these shelves and shelves and shelves. It kind of reminds me of the... Uh, the end of that Indiana Jones, first Indiana Jones movie where they, they put the Ark of the Covenant in that big giant warehouse. That's kind of what they have going on is these amazing artifacts that they're trying to figure out how could we possibly catalog all these things together? How can we put this stuff together? Next slide. And, uh, you know, a lot of the, the stories, and I have this up here, there, when I gave the presentation down in Springfield, we had a number of different slides, but hidden in all that stuff in the History Museum are these great characters that were part of, of the story of Warren County. And one is the great Nicola, which uh, 
was self-proclaimed the world's master magician. Again, I say with Maastricht, self-proclaimed. Uh, but he would do amazing things. If you look at that one picture where the uh, the girl is holding up the, the two guys with like a rock beneath each one of her arms, I mean, he would do these illusion things. And, um, he would always recruit pretty showgirls from our community to go out, and he would try to find the ones that were small enough to fit in his box that he would saw them in half. And it was just basic, wonderful, old-school vaudeville magic. Well, that's one of those things that... You know, we don't have any place that really showcases all this wonderful ephemera that shows who the great Nicola was. And we've got other interesting stories, like Monmouth is the birthplace of Wyatt Earp. Um, and Monmouth is also the home to Ralph Greenleaf, uh, one of the first inaugural uh, inductees in the World uh, Pool Hall of Fame, who was an absolutely great world champion pool player and a bit of a drunk. Uh, before, uh, you know, Minnesota Fats and Willie Moscone. So we've got these great tales. And so what we were trying to think through was, how do we do this? Um, one of the things that we've been fortunate enough is at the city, uh, we've got a pretty strong tech team. And we've taken a really active role in if we don't have the right tool, because we're so limited on funds and people, we try to make it ourselves, and we've built a lot of web-based applications and tools to help run our community and run our city. And um, so we were trying to think, okay, can we use that knowledge to create something really cool, really interesting? Next slide, please. So we decided that when we put together the grant application, we wanted to build an application from the ground up um, as an open source virtual museum uh, suite, which has a front end for exhibits and object exploring and a back end for exhibit curation. And we want to make this robust, but as, uh, as simple as possible so that the senior citizen volunteers at the, uh, at the Historical Society can curate the exhibits, that high school students can do this. So we're basically building this as an open source LAMP application, a Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP application. Uh, that's built upon um, the application framework called CodeIgniter. Um, and we're also st uh, structuring the, uh, the basic layout and CSS through Bootstrap, which is a great tool from, from Twitter. And we're, we're uh, hosting this publicly in an open source repository in GitHub. And our hope is that we can actually create something that when we are done creating a virtual museum, that we can share it with other regions, with other towns, with other counties. And last slide, please. And I just wanted to give you guys a peek at um, this is the prototype of the virtual museum. We are rolling up our sleeves and knee deep in digital muck and gunk. Uh, today we just bolted in an authentication system. Uh, but it's, it's basically a very simple, clean interface. This is showing uh, Ralph Greenleaf and his very exotic wife who was a, a dancer in our community. Um, and it was one of Ralph's few sober moments. Um, but we really wanted to create something that's accessible, that's beautiful, that's fun to use. And on the economic development side of things, one of those little hooks that can help drive real people digitally to the physical places in our community. And that's where we're going with this. Uh, we're actively meeting and developing this right now and are just going to be excited to share this with everyone else. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Paul. That was fantastic. As always, anytime I, I hear it, there's always a great new picture or another example. Um, right now, we can open it up for the next three to four minutes. If there are any questions you have specifically to Paul and the city of Monmouth, you can either type those in here to Aaron or raise your hand and we can unmute you and you can freely talk. The first question we have, Paul, is on that last slide, it looks as though someone must have seen um, the name Wyatt Earp. Is Wyatt Earp from the Monmouth area, and are you going to be utilizing that on the Web Museum? 
Yes, absolutely. Wyatt Earp was uh, born and raised for the first couple years of his life in uh, in Monmouth. And I always think if you think of the, the Kevin Costner uh, Wyatt Earp movie, the first 30 seconds where the kid's running through the cornfield, that's Monmouth right there. Uh, his birthplace is in Monmouth. We have a museum that is actually uh, in trans ownership transition, transitioning over to the Historical Society. And next semester, the local heroes class at the college is going to be focusing on Wyatt Earp and actually taking the ephemera and the, the, the contents of the uh, birthplace museum and turning it into a virtual exhibit for the virtual museum. So that's a great question. Thanks. Uh, the next question, is it known how many people could contribute or did contribute um, to getting this website uh, set up? Well, we've, I mean, there's, there's basically two sets of, of people who are contributing here. The, uh, the people who are helping us put together the content, um, that's, uh, those are going to be some high school students at the high school, volunteers at the Historical Society, um, volunteers at the Buchanan Art Center and the library. Um, so those are, you know, several dozen people in our community. On the tech side, uh, we've got a, um, several dedicated um, programmers who are seniors in the science department um, at Monmouth College. Um, myself, I'm acting as, as the lead coder and the, the tech lead on this. Uh, we've got uh, Bridget Draxler um, and Nikki Dudley who are working at, on database and, and design and Lynn Daw who's the uh, uh, collections librarian at Monmouth College. So we've got a team of about seven or eight of us um, who are actually working through creating the tech. And starting in January we have a, a senior level um, graduate uh, or student class in database design that is helping us work on some of the exhibit design and coding and the model controller view methodology that's going to uh, drive the application under the hood. I, uh, sorry, thank you, Paul. The final question is when do you anticipate having this available online for people to, to view and tour? Well, we should have, uh, I'm guessing, the, uh, the initial, what I'll call an alpha build, which is maybe not all the functionality is there, but, the, but you're going to start to see what's happening, is probably going to be uh, late spring. And we're looking for uh, early summer, hopefully moving to a beta, which is fully functional, but maybe not exactly as smooth as possible, you know, ironing some things out. And our hope is through the... Uh, the tail end of the summer and early next fall to refine this to a spot where um, it could be deployed statewide. But along the way, people who are willing to roll the dice and take a chance uh, can at any time download uh, the software from the, the GitHub repository and be able to try it out. And we're more than helping, willing to help uh, other folks do that and see what they can come up with. Great, thank you. I think those are um, all the questions we have right now. So again, thank you, Paul, and thank you for the questions. And we will move next to Jeannie, who is going to be presenting on the Eastern Illinois Business Solutions. So I'm going to have Erin pull up her slides, and then Jeannie, we will unmute you. And the floor is yours. And again, this is for the Prairie Spark eHub with the Eastern Illinois University Business Solutions Center. Hi, Jeannie. Hello. Thank you for allowing me to have the opportunity to tell everybody what we're up to here at Eastern Illinois University. Um, the Business Solutions Center started in 2008 after a, a regional-wide strategic plan that said, what can we better do? here at Eastern Illinois University to outreach into the community. What were the needs that weren't being met? And um, overwhelmingly, people said, we need to grow our entrepreneurs, encourage them, and connect them throughout the region. So we changed the culture to make it more entrepreneurial, more risk-taking. Uh, research had shown that uh, it's very risk adverse here in central Illinois for a lot of different reasons. And uh, we needed to maybe pull back and get into the uh, education of the youth to maybe make that culture a little bit more uh, risk-taking, entrepreneurial, creative, and problem-solving. Uh, the Business Solutions Center has eight, eight counties in its region. We have three full-time 
uh, employees at this point, and we are um, also hiring a youth educator to help with this because over these years, we've seen a lot of growth in our area, a lot of demand, a lot of people that want this information, but with only three of us, it's hard to give it. So this is when the grant came in, and it was so handy, and you can go to the next slide, please, um, that we created the Prairie Spark uh, Digital Resource Center. So this will give everyone 24-7 online accessibility to a lot of the information, a lot of the resources, a lot of the curriculum that we have developed over these past four years. Um, and if we get volunteers in the region that want to help fellow entrepreneurs, or we get parents, economic developers, librarians uh, that want to start an entrepreneurship club, or teachers that want to get it into their classroom without having us go there, we'll put all of our resources online all the activities, the games, the videos that we have uh, researched and Eastern Illinois University students have helped us identify, put that online so everyone can have a robust and, and thriving club or class or uh, you know whatever they want in their community. So we have, as I said, a few target markets. Uh, first, let's talk about the, the entrepreneur itself. Um, they well, we, entrepreneurs, I'll go a little bit later into that. Um, the, it inspires users to adopt broadband technology. So not only will we have resources for the youth and, and the people that want to uh, assist the youth, but also for entrepreneurs. They can see, we'll have links to, okay, who does broadband in our region? Where are the libraries that have wireless access? We will have maps and things like that. We have also are going to be working with Lakeland College and um, besides just our normal curriculum developed for the clubs, camps, and classes, we're going to have three students work on um, maps to help for site location in our area and to give a little video and testimonial on why market research using GIS business analysts would really be helpful, uh, a helpful tool for the entrepreneurs in the region. In the region. Next slide, please. So for the startup and existing businesses, right now we already have a business entrepreneurship coach. Uh, her name is Tiffany Klein. She does a great job. Um, but we will provide expanded regional information on this site, and then it, then she can also, uh, it, this will enhance her free and confidential coaching and business training that we already do, such as how to start a business. Um, we also do finance and operation uh, classes and the GIS mapping um, to locate best sites for businesses will definitely be used. We also were just talking, I think we're going to have a testimonial of a, a very successful entrepreneur in the region and, and show how he has used that GIS mapping to be more successful with his businesses, which I think will be a, a great addition to that. Um, already we have county by county uh, a list of resource pages that show where you get all the licenses, the fees, uh, where the different inspections you need for your county and for your town. That will all be up by county, which is another nice resource to have. Next slide, please. Um, for the youth, we are sharing contacts, models, and methodology on programming to schools, libraries, and communities. So as I said, the things that we have already developed, the things, the successful tools that we have found online through our research and through EIU students' research will all be put up there for people to look at. Uh, successful uh, education models. So we'll have for each one that is listed here below, we basically started a pipeline of, okay, how do we get entrepreneurship in the, you know, first through fifth grades? And then, okay, there's junior achievement, there's lemonade day, there's certain programs out there like uh, Kane's Arcade. So we show how you can get it at that point. Then we, um, junior high is the next big plug, and we have started an entrepreneurship club down in Effingham that's been very successful. The first year there were, uh, oh, we started, there's about 20, 25 kids that went all year. When we started that club this year, there were 71 people that came to the to the club. They were just really excited about it. And so we've learned sometimes 71, that's almost too much for a club. So we'll, we'll tell the good as well as the bad on, on doing some of these things and what are strategies to make them successful. We also have a high school entrepreneurship camp. We'll be talking about that a little bit in its own. 
Junior Achievement, we have a curriculum for each of their um, wonderful program that they do that uh, the ones that we use here in Charleston, Illinois, we will put on that curriculum. And then in class programming, we have something called Do You Have What It Takes to Be an Entrepreneur? And it gives a personality assessment to see if they have the, the attributes that uh, entrepreneurs have. And they may want to consider that as a career option. And then we have some gaming that goes along with that. So that will all be included. Uh, also, we teach a high school uh, countywide entrepreneurship class. You're going to hear from Craig Limbaugh on one of these other webinars, so I'll let him talk to you more about that. But uh, a lot of that information will be put online. Next slide, please. And the target market for uh, more of the youth side will be for economic developers, librarians, educators, parents, and anyone that would like to uh, start an entrepreneurship program with their youth in their program. We are also going to have a Train the Trainer conference. It will be on April 11th. It will be in between Mattoon and Charleston at the Lifespan Center. And that's when we're going to roll out this eHub. Uh, and then we will have a training and we will be inviting economic developers, librarians, educators, parents, as well as entrepreneurs. And we will have all the people that help create this um, go through and show the different um, valuable things that you can get on this site. And uh, we want to point out that this enhances what we do, and that's why we love this grant. We do have uh, a coach and an educator, so you can look online, you can say, oh, that sounds really interesting, I want to know more. Then you can call our center, and then we can have that one-on-one -on -one interaction after the online session. Next slide, please. So this is basically a summary. We'll motivate individuals to adopt and use the internet to access entrepreneurial tools and just-in-time training. Uh, we will deliver the information, activities, videos, and links to resources, basically best practices of what we found. It took us a lot of time to do it. We might as well share it with the world. And then uh, provide access to a business success network. Uh, we have our own e-blast that there's 2,500 people that uh, will get a bi-monthly e-blast that want to know what's going on in the region in terms of entrepreneurship and youth education. And so we will use that. We will use billboards. We will use brochures. We will go to the Rotaries and the Kiwanis. We'll let everybody know about this site. Um, um, we're pretty good at making sure that the word gets out. And uh, hopefully everybody will learn and um, use this information to grow entrepreneurs in our region. And that's all I have. Great. Thank you so much, Jeannie, for the information and the presentation that was shared. Uh, same process as before with City of Monmouth. If there are any questions, you can type them below and send to us, or you can raise your hand and Erin can unmute you. Okay, Jamie, we have the two comments actually just about how fantastic uh, your logo is. So I just wanted you to know that, that people really like that and just want to share that with you. I, I have to laugh. Uh, an intern who worked for me this summer, he did such a good job. I employed him to do that. We love the idea that, you know, on the prairie there's the lightning bug and, and it's, you know, at the in the evening it's over the bean and cornfields and we thought that would be an appropriate light bulb with the firefly is, is what, what, what we like. So. <laughs> I like it. Uh, the second question is, will it use for the mentor network, will it use social network technology or tools? Oh, thank you for, for pointing that out. Um, I, I did mean to say, yes, we already have a, we have a website and I look, um, please take a look at it. It's the www.eiu.edu slash BSC. So you can see that we do try to, actually, we're just updating it, and by the end of the week, you will see a whole uh, new online template, so it'll look better than ever. And uh, we already have Twitter. We already have Facebook. We already um, have a YouTube site, which we use a lot for youth. We had uh, an iEntrepreneur Challenge this fall that everybody was supposed to interview an entrepreneur and ask them what they learned from their failures. And then we gave away iPads for the winning YouTube video. So we're trying to, to uh, with the youth, we know technology is so important and so ingrained in, 
in their learning, uh, as well as the e-blast that we have. Um, you know, we will definitely, uh, we need to grow our Facebook page. Uh, we're unsure yet whether we will keep it with Business Solutions Center or if we'll have a special one just for Prairie Spark. Um, I would be open to suggestions. Um, you know, we're kind of figuring this out as we go. And I do want to say how we will know our impacts. Uh, we definitely are going to be measuring it by Google Analytics. Um, the p number of people attending the eHub training session on April 11th is going to be uh, an impact. And really, are we driving, one, people to the site, but are we also driving people to get the counseling and the help? Uh, how many more clubs? How many more classes? We're going to try to keep, uh, an, uh, it, you know, um, definitely measures on that to see if we expand and grow uh, the services we're providing. Thank you. And it looks like uh, the last question we have for you is, of course, knowing that there are benefits to each of these, is the content that you're going to provide, will it be specific to the Eastern Illinois region or applicable to the entire state? The, the youth information will be applicable to the entire state. The entrepreneurial resources, some will be applicable to the entire state and some will be a county specific. Um, and the GIS maps, the geographic information maps, they will be towards our eight county region because we feel that, you know, that's, that's who we're serving at this point. Can it be duplicated and replicated by other universities or other small business development centers or any type of economic development agencies? You bet. And so I hope if they see what they like, um, it can, you know, they can, they can adopt it from there. Thank you very much again, Jeannie, for the information that you presented. And the next organization we are moving on to will be the first representative from the Chicagoland area. I am trying to make all of these just an example of different geographies throughout the state. So the next person to present will be Pablo with the Family Christian Health Center. Uh, hold on one second. Pablo, it appears if you're going to be on um, your phone, you need to enter in uh, your audio pen. And I'll send it to you right now. Okay, Pablo, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank yes. you. Oh, very good. I apologize for that. As I was saying, um, we're Family Christian Health Center, and we're a faith-based community health center out in the Harvey area in Chicago. And uh, our broadband initiative is the implementation of a patient web portal. Uh, next slide, please. Just a little history, um, as I mentioned, we are a non-for-profit, and we were founded in 2000 by four passionate providers who saw a disparity in access to health care. And they went about developing a, a needs assessment to see what are the, the challenges in the South Suburban area in terms of the, the working poor, the underserved, and the underinsured. And um, Collectively, they were able to form a family Christian, and um, they were able to provide medical, much-needed medical services to the to the community. Uh, next slide, please. Um, today, uh, we pretty much uh, provide a comprehensive uh, health services. And um, we also have a same day uh, evening medical services. We realize that there are many challenges that our patient population have, and sometimes health care is not uh, the top of the list, providing food, providing shelter. And so to be able to to meet those needs is it's a it's a thing that uh, that we're passionate about. We received federally qualified uh, health center status, which basically allows us to be the safety net for the community. 
um, health may not be necessarily like a top priority as I mentioned and if they have asthma per se they may not uh, take the cues that they're having a, an episode and they may let it go by and go by to eventually they may end up needing emergency room services well the FQHC promise is to be able to prevent that by being their uh, primary care provider and providing a sliding scale to overcome some of those uh, uh, access issues and so the FQAC allows us to do that. But that's a double-edged sword for us. Um, next slide, please. Uh, our mission statement is uh, allows for the health care and also allows for the religion aspect. As we look at our patient, we don't look at them in terms of just uh, primary care and dental and behavioral health, but we look at, at them holistically with the spiritual component as well. The next slide, please. One of the key core things, and I look at my, our vision statement, is the, the premier provider. We want to be that premier provider. And as I mentioned, as an FQHC, it's a double-edged sword because we get mandated to do things, and a lot of times there is no funding available to do those things. One of those things being the uh, EMR, electronic medical record. Another mandate is to have a patient portal. But we, can't, you know, we don't have the funds. Um, a lot of the funding that we do receive is basically to provide that patient care and to be able to implement a patient portal uh, would fall to the wayside if it wasn't for uh, the Illinois Broadband uh, Innovation Fund. And the other piece is outcomes in our measures. Um, the, the, the Bureau tells us that not only do you have to provide the health care, but we want to see the outcomes. We want to see that the, they're receiving some positive uh, health outcomes in terms of uh, lowering the sugar level for diabetes, uh, for hypertension, and for uh, asthmatic patients. Um, there is a realignment taking place in the healthcare industry, and a lot of the, the smaller community-based organizations and uh, private practices uh, don't have the funds to get there. It, it's, a, it's a shame that we can track a package from beginning to end and how it got there more than we can track a patient. Um, so the, 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 the funding that we get allows us for like our EMR not only to track the patient but also to gather the data to find um, how we're doing with, with the disease management, how we're doing with our asthmatic. Um, it also allows us to implement the, the portal which a lot of our incentive programs like meaningful use and patient-centered medical home uh, require and so if it wasn't for the funding we would not be able to meet these standards. Um, next slide please. We're comprehensive in scope in that that we don't only focus on primary care but we focus on the on, uh, on the other aspects as well in terms of dentistry, behavioral health, uh, pastoral care and uh, we do have on-site laboratory and pharmacy and soon we'll be having our, our patient portal. Um, we focus on disease management because it's, it's, it's we're trying to make sure that our patient population is healthy and there are things that we can do to make sure that they are healthy. Our patient portal will allow us to disseminate information to continue on that path. Um, next slide, please. Currently we have two sites our Harvey site and our Dalton site and we're hoping to expand and have a school-based clinic where we can provide uh, the student population with immunizations and with physicals right there in the school. It would also become an access point for the parents so they won't have to come to our sites they can go to the school clinic and be seen there. Next slide. The funding we received is for the, the patient web portal and it's a, it's a beautiful thing because it allows us to meet other standards. One of the key things is the meaningful use. The federal government is pushing us to use a, a, an EMR which is a great thing because not only are we able to track uh, outcomes but also certain standards and one of those standards is to be able to communicate with, uh, uh, with patients and to be able to communicate with other providers that's, that's uh, in a secured fashion and that it's uh, uh, HIPAA compliant. So we'll be able through 
the patient board will be able to leverage those scarce financial resources and, and meet that standard. Also for our patient center medical home, which is another incentive program, we, we want it to be patient-centered, not medical-centered, but to focus on the patient holistically, to be comprehensive, make it a one-stop shop. We know that the patients uh, get challenged on a lot of different areas, and we want to make sure that we become their medical home, and the patient portal uh, fits those pieces and allows us to meet those standards. Next page. The portal is going to allow the, the patients to finally access their chart and view their, their patient pro profile so they'll be able to see if there was any errors in the insurance information, any errors in the mailing address, and, and fix those. They'll be able to, I know I go to the doctor and I have three things that I need to talk about. I talk about the first two pieces in depth, get caught up in that, leave. And on my way home, I realized I wanted to ask that question and I forgot. Well, now there's an opportunity without having to wait three months for the next appointment that you can send an email to the provider, ask that question, and get a response back. The other piece is to finally make an appointment without having to go through the phone menu. I mean, it was nice back in the day when you had a voice and you can communicate and get it done, but, but that time has come and gone. So to be able to reach out and, and make that appointment and, and, and get a response back. Uh, the, to get a refill back, they'll be able to, through this broadband initiative, jump online and, and request that refill. And I know sometimes I forget and I see that my meds are running low and by the time I try to reach out to the doctor and you know they're two months out, that puts me in a situation where uh, I'm not taking my medication. So to be able to jump online and request that refill it would be a nice thing for our community. The other piece is to, to be able to fill out all those different forms and, and get it done in a timely fashion so that when you get to the clinic you don't have to worry about those things. The portal also allows us to, to send out specific emails to specific uh, uh, patients. So if we're having a, a diabetes class, we can target that subset of our patient population and inform them that we're going to have this free uh, educational series that you can participate and learn more about how to manage uh, your um, disease. The other piece is that we're leveraging the Broadband Innovation Fund by not only through the funds and through all these other incentive programs, but also engaging um, the youth. Our youth is uh, technologically savvy and they know how to use uh, uh, the, the internet and smartphones. So we want to gauge them as a partnership uh, and tap the high school and colleges to come to our clinic and help reach to our patients who may not necessarily know how to use those particular, uh, uh, like the internet, and who may or may not have uh, an email address to show them how to create that so that way they can access the, uh, the patient portal. Some of our patients may have home internet, some of them may not, but to teach them where they can go to get those free internet services via the library or other community-based organizations that offer a free internet. The other piece is we see a lot of our patients with smartphones and, and how to be able to utilize all the functionality of that smartphone um, with the, the patient portal. There will be an app that they'll be able to do all the pieces that are outlined on the slide. Um, so we want to engage the youth so they can uh, help the patients and help us educate the patients on, on broadband. The next slide, please. Um, basically, you know, I wanted to, to thank the Illinois Broadband Initiative uh, Innovation Fund for providing us the, the funding to be that premier provider for our community. And a special thanks to the staff in the Springfield office for their due diligence in keeping us on track. And also a special mention to our Chicago E-Team representative, Ernie Sanders. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much, Pablo, for the kind words to our team. Um, Lacey Buss is is definitely the, the one. She's been great at doing a lot of the 
communication to each of you. So I thank you for that. And I am very happy to see through this process, we really are starting to have more interaction with our E-teams and the E-team coordinators that are placed throughout the state. We have two or three of them on our call today. So at the end, if you have any questions for each of them, I can unmute. And the same process as before, if there are any questions for Pablo, please type them in, or we can unmute you to ask live. Okay, Pablo, the first question, will the portal technology be custom built or is it based on an existing tech platform? Um, we, we were looking at three particular uh, vendors. They can uh, modify to, to meet our needs. Our, our challenge is, is that we have an electronic medical record that it needs to interface with that, which is our centricity practice system. So we're, we have to reach to a very narrow uh, vendors who already have that interface so that way we can keep our costs low. So there are certain things that we can change, but, but the bulk of it will be um, tied into the vendor because of the centricity in our EMR. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, how do you initially engage the, the youth? Will it be through their school? Um, yes, the, the, the plan is since we're working on this school-based clinic, we're already working with the superintendents in the school. So what we want to do is uh, not only you know provide healthcare services to the school population, but also bring them back to the, the Harvey site so they can uh, teach the, the, the patients and um, on all the aspects of the patient portal. We'll train them, we'll talk to them about you know, the sensitivity about the patient population and how some of them have internet access, some of them don't, um, some of them may have an, uh, email assets, and, and how to create an email account so that way the patients get the information and they can be uh, self-empowered to continue moving forward with this broadband um, initiative. Thank you. I believe we have one more question, and that is, who are you going to have provide the training to those that may not know how to use the web portal? Well, what's going to happen is our, our vendor will train our staff on how to use the, all the functionality, and then we will be in conjunction doing some of the training and then engaging the youth and teaching them about the functionality. And then we will eventually get to the point where we allow the youth to do the training while we take a step back and monitor uh, their progress in the education. So that way if there's any missteps or sometimes we may say something that may not be quite uh, correct, we can then intervene and say the, the, the portal can accomplish these tasks. Okay, great. Thank you so much for answering all of those questions. I, if it's okay, I will now move on to the fourth and final awarded project for the day, and that is Dot World Group. And Jim, I believe we're handing everything over to you, correct? And you're handling the slides on your end? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. I'll go ahead and make you the presenter now, Jim. Okay. All right, you should be the presenter. All right. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, looks good. Okay. And, all right. Uh, so um, we're, we're going to talk about um, Escape Locally and Market Space. Market Space is the name of the software application and the project. And we're really focused on contemporary economic and business development solutions. Um, let's see here. Uh, the, the PowerPoint is not advancing. I don't know why. Let me try reloading the, the opening the PowerPoint up again. For some reason, when we tried this the other day, it worked just fine. All right, let me try it again. All right, there it goes. All right, so um, economic and business development solutions that make it easy, fun, and productive. 
Whenever I close this. Then just go ahead and click on the PowerPoint and you should be able to just click on it now and then you should be able to. Okay. All right. I'm closing. I, I it. Yep. Okay. Now, here we go. All right. Um, it's working fine now. Thank you. Um, contemporary economic and um, business development solutions to make it easy, fun, and productive to sell, shop, and collaborate online, locally, globally. So the point here is that our economic development focus is on how to take um, communities like Champaign-Urbana or Mammoth or Charleston, Illinois, and uh, somebody at my office. Just a second. All right, I'm ready to go. I, I'm on. I'm, I, you need to go back into the other office. I'm on a conference call. So I just stayed at home, right? So move. move no. no, I move. I'm not, sorry about that. My daughter showed up in my office. I don't know why, but um, she does that. Okay. I apologize for that. So, um, uh, no so anyway, so the idea is for communities like I just named to be able to um, uh, use the internet to extend their reach, not just locally but globally, and do that with a point of view of economic and business development. Um, we developed with MarketSpace an all-in-one e-commerce platform. Uh, and we've done this by uh, developing a system in Southern Illinois that we call Escape Locally. And uh, the all, all-in-one e-commerce platform, what we mean, it has four different components. The shop locally components include web storefronts that allow businesses, um, whether it's um, an artist or somebody that's a local food producer, to have their own storefronts um, within a single community-oriented platform, uh, and also to have vendor-managed coupons, much like Groupon or um, Living Social, we have a whole coupon system. And then the Escape Locally part, um, which is about tourism and hospitality booking. So we have travel packages and um, restaurant and B&B uh, uh, &B and cabin rentals. All of that as part of the tourism and hospitality booking. And we also do custom event ticketing. So in one e-commerce platform, it's not just the ability to have a storefront, but it's the ability to manage and uh, present coupons, to provide tourism and hospitality, and to do custom event ticketing. Um, the market space features, um, it allows communities, organizations, and businesses to have e-commerce with that full suite of transactional formats that I just mentioned, the all-in-one, it also can allow businesses to use the system for a point-of-sale um, system so that um, uh, right now we're setting up one of our clients in Southern Illinois that has an interest in taking what they've had currently on just the Escape Locally portal and creating a storefront where they can actually use that online and in their and in their business and have a single inventory system. And then it also allows us to set up flexible networks so that in a region we can take communities and actually link them together so that we can present not just a community but an entire region. The real the formula, the economic development formula is to expand local economies by bringing the full power of the web to Main Street businesses with advantages that really are not available elsewhere um, and at prices that encourage adoption. And through our program, we do this with trusted community organizations that they're already used to dealing with. Um, and the vendors themselves are able to create and maintain their own profiles, their own storefronts, their own inventories, prices, travel packages, event ticketing, et cetera, um, so that, you know, much like if you have a page on Facebook, um, if you so desire, you can go in there and set that up. Um, you can put your own content in. You can create campaigns to promote your Facebook page. The same thing is true with our, our market space system. 
um, uh, that allows the vendors direct access to do that. Um, it's also important that they can measure results. So we provide a variety of reports ranging from site usage to site visitors to product sales. So each individual vendor that's part of one of our systems like Escape Locally to Southern Illinois will be able to um, monitor how many um, visitors and what types of visitors are coming to their particular section of it, what products are selling, um, you know, regular product reports, but the community itself can monitor how well is the community promoting itself to the world as a whole. In Southern Illinois, there is a real interest in creating a brand identity for Southern Illinois. Um, not, um, and there's no major metropolitan area. There's really no equivalent to a Champaign or a Springfield or a Peoria. There, it's, it's made up of much smaller communities. And tourism is a growing industry so that it's becoming a destination. And through Escape Locally to Southern Illinois, we've been able to help brand Southern Illinois as a destination. Um, the program that we offer, um, we call it the Shop Locally, Escape Locally program, is um, it takes advantage of the marketplace uh, e-commerce platform ability to create a tiered network. So um, what we do is we set up a regional distributor, and the regional distributor has uh, a horizontal market geographic focus. So in other words, everything in that region um, is can be part of it. So whether or not it's a restaurant, it's an artist, it's a local food producer, it's a toy store, it, that's what I mean by hor it's horizontally integrated within a specific geographic region. And there's within the region, whatever the scope of that geog geographic region is, there is a, um, a, a marketplace site that represents that region. The regional distributor then sets up community hosts, and community hosts would be, um, so let's say I'll use Southern Illinois as an example again. We have a regional site that covers about a 20-county area of Southern Illinois, but within that site, uh, communities can have their own um, embedded community sections so that um, all of the um, lodging, the restaurants, the things to do, the businesses that have online shopping can all be viewed from just that community's point of view. And the community can actually create its own market space website. Um, and all of that information is maintained both on the community level and the regional level. And um, let's see if I lost focus again. There it goes. Okay. And then within a community, we also have community of interests, hosts. Um, and community of interests are things like chambers of commerce, Main Street organization, tourism. You can see the list here. Live music, wine, beer, spirit sector. Uh, locally produced food is something that is really important. Events and event ticketing. Um, again, in Southern Ireland, why we maintain one of the only regional calendar of events for that entire area. And we call these um, CIO hosts. Um, and what we found is that in, even though we have a regional site for Southern Illinois and we're preparing to do that in areas of Central Illinois, um, um, entities that are like the Main Street Association for Downtown Carbondale is interested in using our system and our technology to promote its downtown businesses. So within this tiered network, we've allowed for um, regional, community, and then within a community, even communities of interest, to all be well represented in this economic development model. Um, now, um, again, communities of hosts, I mean, COI hosts um, can have their own website. For example, a chamber of commerce could have its own website or it could have uh, that, that has its uh, storefronts for all of its members, or they could have an embedded section within an existing marketplace site. They don't have to have their own site. It can work either way. And the real goal of all of this is to sign up vendors, which are local merchants and venues that um, either have embedded content, you can see the example of the list there, or have their own 
private marketplace websites that gets linked back into this network. And we also, um, the last piece of this structure is the ability to license in local areas marketplace site developers so that existing web e-commerce development firms in any particular area can become authorized to uh, participate in building these websites for individual businesses or community organizations. Um, and that way, um, we're further engaging the local area from an economic development point of view.